There doesn't seem to be tears, so we will continue. So I'm listening on the, on the radio, there's a team of guides working together trying to f find uh, some fresh tracks of those lions that we've seen last night, the Birmingham males. So Hayden is working with, with a team of other guides and on the radio they discuss plans as to check which area so that two vehicles aren't working in the same place. And it really does help hugely to to work as teams when tracking animals. first for any first timers welcome to the Radio check. Tree and it. I hope you can hear that. That is. A woodpecker that's not actually looking for food it's communicating it's found a hollow branch and this specific woodpecker is a bearded woodpecker and it's known to communicate by knocking on these hollow trees I'm going to see if we can get a visual of it I was hoping it was going to be in a this big dead knob thorn over here We're getting closer, we're getting closer. Oh, there it is. If you follow the right hand branch of that dead tree, it's just about half.
about halfway up. Not overlooking anything you, you do you encounter while past. Good morning folks, welcome to Safari Live. My name is Hayden Turner and I've got Brian in here with me today. Brian and I have had some pretty good luck over the last 24 hours. The lucky porcupine coil is here. We've both given it a bit of a rub this morning. It was a pretty exciting afternoon yesterday. Uh, we had those five Birmingham males and we're looking for them again this morning. There's a lot of vehicles, or a few of us anyway, out trying to find the tracks to see if these, uh, th those five lines have actually come out of the reserve and gone into another reserve. And this is a borderline. The thing that we've got going for us this morning is it's A, it's very, very cool, 18 degrees and 64 Fahrenheit. I'll try and get off these corrugations for you. Uh, the other thing we've got going for us is this. It rained last night and it rained pretty hard. Uh, we got a bit of a storm. And what that has done is obliterated all the, the tracks from yesterday. So any tracks that happened after the rain, we will be able to see. Now, it can go against us in one way. That's if the tracks going across the road happened before the rain. So this is where a little bit of crime scene investigation work goes on. If the tracks went across the road before the rain, they'll be obliterated and we'll still be able to pick them up. But... Uh, they won't be as easy to see and they won't be as fresh. So what we're looking for this morning potentially is any tracks that have gone across the road, fresh tracks after the rain, we'll know that where the animals have gone either into Arethusa or they're still in Juma. And we can also keep our eyes open because the cats are probably going to be more active today than they would be uh, on a hot morning. It's, it's very, very cool this morning, actually enough that I'm thinking about putting a jacket on. But uh, the most important thing is we utilize this time to our benefit and we look for whatever we can. We also had two records, uh, one sighting and one uh, really, really fresh tracking in two different locations on Juma of Leopard last night after we closed. And uh, Scott is chasing that up. He's really excited about it. And I, I, I really wanted to find a, a leopard this morning. Just it's like the, I don't know, it's like the, the connecting with Juma type of... Uh, type of situation or encounter and I really want that to happen for him this morning. So I've gone on to these lines with Brian. Uh, we're listening to the radio as we speak and uh, trying to find out any information that we can. They could be still in this area. Last night when we did see them they looked quite lean. Uh, now when you look at lions and they're quite lean, uh, in other words they don't have these big bulging bellies and they're lying on their side digesting their food there's a good chance that they'll get up and hunt. Uh, last night, they sort of started to get active about 10 minutes before we closed, and uh, we had to let them go off into the bush, basically, because the bush was A, too thick to go through, and we were coming to the end of our, our time. But I think the most important thing was we were with those cats. We, we, uh, we know that what their location was last night. Loads of the other... Uh, guides and trackers are onto it this morning to try and figure out where they've gone and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. On another story which I'll just pull up to show you uh, and just turn off so the wind is not too bad on the microphones for us. One thing we were looking for the other day, now this isn't the hippo that we, uh, our, our old resilient pool that we were looking for. Um, I'm going to show you two different shots. This is a, a picture of, or just a silhouette or a drawing of uh, the hippopotamus uh, footprint that we were looking for the other day. And it looks something like that. That's very uh, sort of stylized and a little bit um, not really as true as it looks, okay? But uh, that's roughly what you sort of get. 
it should be a little bit better than that. Now what I'm going to show you now is one that Brian and I just saw on the road here. It wasn't our, our hippo, excuse me, but uh, let me just uh, get the picture up. <coughs> very, very hard to make out, but I'll just give you a little bit of a, a sort of pointer. I'll hold it nice and still for Brian as well, so he can get it together there. Have a look there, there's the one toe, another toe, a front toe, another one, and another one there. Can you see that? It's, a, it's an old track, or when I say an old track, it's probably happened yesterday evening, because uh, this little bit of broken soil in there has either been flicked up by one of his other feet, or potentially our vehicle, which was that close. You can see the tire track there. But that's a hippo footprint. And it's just to show you guys that uh, that's what we were looking for when we were looking for that bull. And I really thought it was a nice one just to show you uh, a little bit about uh, tracking. Now, we touched on it. We've touched on it a couple of times. We're going to touch on it a bit more. Uh, it's a really important thing to get into our heads, particularly when we're looking for big cats. And uh, we can carry on along this road, and when we get up to an area that we know they sort of were in. We're sort of trying to narrow the area down at the moment. And I'm, I'm just turning the uh, game drive channel back up so I can hear them. They will let us know if anyone finds anything. It's pretty windy here this morning, folks, so apologies about the audio. I'm speaking up and projecting as much as we can, uh, but there is a bit of a breeze blowing at the moment. We will go down and check on the hyena as well. Uh, have a little bit of a look down there. Just listening to the Game Drive channel, folks. Excuse me for a second. So what, we, what we've got in our ear, folks, is two different feeds of information. I've got uh, an earpiece in that tells me information from the control room, if our signal needs to get to a, uh, a more positive area, or our questions come through on that as well. And anything that the control room needs to get to us, uh, they can get to us through this earpiece. The other feed that I've got going into the same earpiece, <laughs> which is it's sometimes a little bit tricky to, to uh, decipher what conversation you're listening to, is uh, about 15 different guides around the two reserves that are talking to each other uh, when they find uh, a sighting. Now that sighting, they won't talk over the top of each other. Uh, there'll only be two people having a conversation at once, but um, sometimes control, uh, our control talks over the top of that. So it does get quite, you really got to concentrate, uh, and at the same time, I've got to tell you that information. <laughs> so it all works well. We'll get there in the end. <coughs> so just looking for tracks, there's five males. So five males tracks of line should be quite uh, distinct across this road, unless they were obliterated by the, the storm. If they've walked across in the wet in the wet sand, it's absolutely beautiful to see. It's like artwork uh, to see those footprints in the sand. So the whole idea is that you're not only are you looking on the road, but you've also got to glance up and, and look around here. And that's where it's great to have Brian on board and VM because they're our extra set of eyes and they're scanning around through the bush as well uh, when they can but they've also got to concentrate on the shot so it's nice just to know a little bit about the mechanics of how this works and what we try and do to get these uh, pictures to you as well as try and find animals <laughs> but the lucky porcupine quill is with us this morning so we've uh, 
We're feeling good. I'm going to take a left just here and go back to uh, where we found them and sort of cruise along that road and see if they didn't do a, a sort of out and then a back into that road and we might be able to see some tracks going across that road as well. I just have an urge, some, for some reason I've just got an urge just to drive along this a little bit further. All I'm doing when I'm looking out this side of the vehicle is looking for tracks that have gone into this soft sand. The other important thing is to not uh, drive over the tracks if you can. <coughs> Quite important that uh, you leave the tracks as, as clear and as uh, with as much integrity to the track as you possibly can and that gives the other, particularly the really specialist Shangan trackers that work with a lot of the, the guides, it allows them to really pick up some top information about their direction and uh, potentially where they've gone. So I think I might, I might turn around and uh, go back along that road as we were. I just wanted to have a little look up this direction and see if there was anything. Actually, just bear with me folks for a little bit more just to uh, satisfy my appetite for this. So the whole idea is to try and build up a bit of a picture. And when you're doing simple tracking like this, uh, all you're looking for is some track or sign, some spore. Uh, and once we pick that up, we get a little bit more of an indicator. Now to follow those tracks, then you start to get uh, a tracker off a vehicle. And that tracker would then follow the animals into the bush and then try and get a uh... yes I can hear what you're saying follow the uh, line into the bush yes well that's that's what they do and they're quite extraordinary at it but they get a visual and then uh, come back to the vehicle it, incredibly experienced uh, trackers that have just got it's an art form it's a real skill that uh, you, you uh, take many, many years and are born into it. And then you can go to the next level of tracking, which is like intuitive tracking. And that's like uh, another world of tracking. That's when you're starting to, th your intuition is starting to tell you what the animal's doing. And uh, that is like, something that's hard to explain in words. When you watch someone that can do that, you, you scratch your head and like say to yourself, how, how did you know that? And yeah.
they're your new best friend because they're just incredible. They're just an incredible person to be around. Uh, intuitive trackers are uh, uh, something else. Well, I can't. I just got a call. Yeah, copy, mate. Stand by. Folks, I'm just listening to the radio. I do apologise. Folks, I'm just listening to the radio. I'm just working this out. I do apologise. Sorry guys, I really apologise about this. HT break. HT break. HT, HT, the last caller. Yeah, copy Scott, uh, copied all that mate, uh, thanks so much and uh, we're going to try and follow that up. Yeah, copy mate. Copy, mate. Thank you so much, mate. We're uh, we're on Gallery Main now, so we'll uh, we'll motor along. Folks, so much. I, I really, really apologise. I've got uh, three people talking to me on the radio here, <coughs> and um, trying to figure out where these line are. I think they've found them. So I'm just going to drive along. We've still got to confirm where they are, and there's a little bit of a line-up. Uh, there's probably about two or three vehicles waiting to see them. So let's just see what happens when we get down there. And. Uh, I've got uh, three people talking to me on the radio here <coughs> and um, trying to figure out where these line are. I think they've found them. So I'm just going to drive along. We've still got to confirm. And uh, see how we go. I apologize. down there we just got to stay back here a little bit a minute um, we'll we'll wait our turn but we can still get a pretty nice view just from where we are have a look down there lying on the road is one of the Birmingham boys with a successful successful kill from last night now just to the left of him is uh, one of those kills so 
Uh, let me just make a few calls on the radio, see who's in control of this lock, and uh, we'll definitely uh, make a plan here, folks. I know what you're thinking, everyone. How is that man sitting on the, the bonnet of that vehicle? Well, he's a tracker, and they've got nerves of steel. Copy, man, copy. Okay, folks, we've just got to uh, move back a little bit because uh, there's a queue. And we're just going to move back to here a little bit to wait our turn. And uh, just let me uh, make a few calls to see how long. Just listening to the radio, folks, there's a lot of stuff going on in my ear at the moment with vehicles waiting for this, so uh, we're going to have to really pull back off this. I do apologise, but I'm just going to give Texan, one of the guides, a call and find out what the situation is. Texan, Texan, you copy? Jackson, uh, can you just inform me how many vehicles are on this lineup, please, mate?
Real apologies, folks. I, I uh, just need to sort this out. And um, once I sort this out, uh, we'll be able to know exactly where we stand. We might be able to just have a little drive around. There's about three different conversations going on in my ear at the moment. <laughs> it always makes life interesting. Radios on uh, Angala, on Juma. Can uh, someone give me a uh, update on how many vehicles are in the lineup, please? Copy, mate. Thank you. Well, the to all radios on Ngala. Could someone give me a uh, an update on how many vehicles are on uh, on the lineup, please? Yeah, copy, mate. Okay, mate. Uh, is that channel four, you think? Thank you so much, mate. I really appreciate it. Standing by. So, folks, what I'm trying to do <coughs> is just find out how many vehicles are on... Uh, there's about four different channels to make things a little bit more confusing. And uh, just trying to figure out what, uh, what channel, um, sorry, how many vehicles are in the lineup down there. Uh, the information I heard was a little bit different to what it was by the time I got there. So uh, we just had to pull out because there was a vehicle coming up behind us. Now, this is all about um, how the, the safari sort of industry works. And it's really important that uh, that you share those sightings and if someone was in the queue, exactly like with anything else, uh, you would step back and just be polite and, uh, and do that. And there was absolutely no worries. We just stuck our nose in down there just to sort of see what was going on. Um, it's absolutely fine. They've killed a buffalo, so they're not gonna be going anywhere soon. So we can just sit for a second and, um, and uh, make sure we don't uh, intrude on any other person's uh, encounter. Just stand by, excuse me. Yeah, copy, mate. Yeah, we're about uh, 100 metres away on uh, Gowrie Main, mate. Okay, mate. Uh, thanks so much for that, mate. I really appreciate it. Um, we'll just sit pretty for a second and uh, see how we get on. Thanks so much, mate. Appreciate it. So, uh, there's a lot of vehicles in the lineup. So, I think what we might do, guys, is uh, have a bit of a drive around. Um, I promise you, those, those animals aren't going anywhere. Uh, there's a buffalo there, they'll be sitting there for uh, at least the next sort of 24 hours. So I think what we should do is just drive into the reserve a little bit and uh, maybe see what else we can find. And then I'll keep my ear to the radio and wait for our slot and then we can come back to it. Now I hope you understand, I'm sure you understand. Um, it's really important that uh, we keep that code of conduct and uh, that respect and, and our manners uh, of the utmost importance uh, when it comes to uh, this industry and we will do that and we'll just go on and uh, have a little bit of a look around and see what else we can find. We'll cut into one of these roads just here. We've got um, lots of other animals to see. 
and uh, see how we get on. I'm just going to do a bit of turn around here. most important thing folks is we know where they are uh, it's a great thing that we know where they are and well you couldn't get it much easier compared to what we've been up to in the last uh, few weeks they're pretty much uh, made a kill right by the road uh, and that's <laughs> that's good good for us Just going to take a, uh, a drive in through here. And just have a little bit of a, a look through here while we're waiting because I just don't want to sit there and wait. Uh, you hear me talk enough. <laughs> I think uh, it's probably nice to do a bit of driving as well. Uh, I'll just get a little update on what we can do here from this location. some nice little wildebeest here. I think it's a buffalo they've killed. I couldn't really see it. It looks like a buffalo by the size of the animal, but it could be a wildebeest as well. Uh, it was a dark animal. It was behind a tree. We didn't really get a chance to see, but um, there's a lot of wildebeest in this area and it uh, could have been a wildebeest, but uh, for the five of them, uh, that would be maybe not a uh, uh, as, as big a meal as we think but we uh, definitely know that they're there and I think it was a buffalo by the size of the the animal that uh, we were looking at down there. Wildebeest are definitely uh, a sought after uh, food from uh, buffalo, um, sorry from lion and uh, they will definitely go for wildebeest but this, the top of the menu, the top of the list for lion is uh, is buffalo. So, a line kill, uh, uh, which is pretty impressive. I'm sure Scott is doing his darndest to uh, find Yes, yeah, so a line kill, uh, which is pretty impressive. I'm sure Scott is doing his darndest to uh, find leopard this morning. It feels a bit strange this weather. It feels like it could rain at any point, but um, I'm not really sure what it's going to do. As I said, the, the, the temperature is in our favor when it comes to activity for the predator. Really, really nice temperature for them. They can, fight, they can sort of operate in this temperature very, very nicely and for much pro more prolonged periods.
So this is the road that was parallel to where we saw the line last night and that was probably only about uh, 500 metres from where it was. So when, we, when, when Peter was talking about those uh, buffalo last night, we'll have, to, we'll have to verify this because we're not sure it is a buffalo. But if it is a buffalo, um, it was potentially one of those from the herd. Uh, also, uh, we're not sure about that, but we can just sort of, we're trying to put some um, the, the sort of crime scene, so to speak, together. And the only reason I say crime scene, it's like the sort of CSI type of, uh, you know, using all your forensic evidence uh, and trying to find out what happened uh, last night. We saw them walking off this direction, so they've definitely, uh, we put our, our sort of intuition into gear last night. We saw that they were quite lean. Uh, they, they looked like they were going to go off and hunt, and sure enough, they did. And with five males like that, um, of that size, you're definitely going to have success uh, as long as they're in an area where there's available food source. So great stuff, good for them. Excuse me. You do find sometimes that you get um, lions that become absolute buffalo specialist hunters. That's uh, all they really seek out, uh, particularly when the lion prides are quite big. So the number of females in the pride de depends on the food availability of food. You'll get these little splint off and potentially join up with a, uh, another male or another couple of males. Uh, depending, it's quite a dynamic sort of thing. It's all really about food in that regard. If there isn't enough food to feed the pride, then you'll get animals breaking off from the pride. But then when you do get the right recipe, the right sort of, uh, and the right amount of food availability, you get some pretty awesome uh, prides that are very, very powerful. And when they are big, uh, in a sense that they're about sort of maybe 13 to 15 animals uh, and sometimes more, you find that they have to kill pretty much every day because there's so many mouths to feed. So it's a big, a big and a constant effort. Socially, people, the bigger it gets, it can be a little bit more unstable in these sort of normal nine to sort of 11, maybe seven to 11 numbers that can operate quite successfully. What we'll do now is go just down here and see if we can go and visit our little hyena den and see if the hyenas are there. There's a good potential uh, that they actually might be lingering around up there as well, but uh, we won't know about that until we and see if the hyenas are there. There's a good potential uh, that they actually might be lingering around up there as well, but uh, we won't know about that until we get there. So grey skies overhead, but sun trying to peek its uh, nose through at the moment. And uh, it will get a little bit warm but if it stays like this, it's, it's fantastic. It's a great temperature for going on drive. So we're just cutting up onto Rebecca's Road. This is sort of where we saw, coming up to where we saw the line last night. So they haven't traveled very far as the crow flies. So stuff at Lion, you've got Leopard, you've got Hyena on the property. The only thing uh, that would be the perfect equation 
Well, the perfect scenario would be cheetah somewhere and walk, and then you'd wow. Where else? But definitely mentioned in the last couple of uh, nights to guides and different people saying that there are they are hanging around reserves quite close to here. So you never know. They travel massive distances to to uh, in their in their range or their hunting uh, sort of territory. So if you've got any questions, uh, please send them to questions at wildearth.tv. That's questions at wildearth.tv. Tweet us at hashtag safari live. That's hashtag safari live. Try and get to as many as we tick morning. Uh, radios and the reserves and, and so on, but we get there in the end, we do. Uh, and I do apologize again about those little quiet spots where you're basically just looking at me staring off into the distance. I'm listening to about four different conversations in my ear. Um, I wish you could hear that, but I'll tell you what it could cross to. And we're having you go crazy with it as well. And we're having you go crazy with it as well. I'm just listening to the radio again, folks. There's also talk at the moment. Sometimes you can just be driving along for uh, an hour or so and not hear a great deal at all. People will ask for updates, uh, and everyone is very, very helpful with each other to try and give any information they can. But sometimes it's just quiet, you know, uh, and that's the way it is. It's the bush, that's animals, that's wildlife, not a theme. Park. It's basically do uh, these pictures and find these animals for you. Um, Getting a lot of requests uh, on Twitter and email to find out what apps that I use. Uh, the, the app that I just showed you, the hippopotamus footprint on, if you just go into uh, the app store and type in uh, guides, and matter. Uh, you get some really good ones. You get it's it's nice just to get the light version. Uh, many of uh, the apps do supply you with a light version. And if you're not familiar with what that is, uh, sorry, that's a bit windy right here. So I'll just try and get out of this wind before I explain this for you. Can you can see the mine's not just one of the most important people on this vehicle. He's also my eyes in the sky. Uh, I could never have seen that from where I'm sitting here, so that's great. We're going to pop on down and see them. Um, it, most apps have got something called a light version, a free version, but a light version um, is just gives you a few different uh, prefer um, the one that's got all the, the, the birds on one plate or one, uh, one sort of uh, page on a book um, and then others prefer the picture of the bird or the image of the bird on every page. Uh, different apps have different styles of developing uh, their, their sort of uh, references and how you go through the book or the, the app. So it's really up to you. Go and have a look and uh, the thing I like about the bird apps is that they've got the calls, whereas the books don't have the calls. And the calls are very, very important. Uh, the call and the song of a bird is something that you'll probably hear more than see uh, the, the birds. So I find those apps really, really important. Uh, and with the with more than see uh, the, the birds. So, I find those apps really, really important, uh, and with the with the mammal ones, the tracks I also find really important. So go look and uh, 
and, and just sort of see which ones you like and it's really up to you. There's a lot of great ones out. Let's go and find our little hyena friends. A little bit bumpy through here, folks. Let's make our way down to these. Ooh. There they are. There's Mama and Youngster. Looking beautiful there. How's that, Brian? Well, look at that. There she is. And there he or she is. We're not sure about the, the sex of the, the youngster. Hello, little guy. Ndapandula, Peter has named it. Ndapandula, that little one. Very playful this morning, nice and cool. Let's see if he comes down and investigates us again this morning like he did the other day. You might hear some rustling around folks. I'm just getting my camera out just to take a couple of images. Very relaxed this morning. They've got a lovely temperature to lie around in. Not too hot. Hello buddy, hello, how are you going buddy, look at this, he's so close we can't even get an image of him. <laughs> I'm just saying him but we're not sure it's a him or a her at the moment, uh, very difficult to uh, sex uh, puppies. Uh, cubs, sorry. Oh, fantastic. He's about uh, two metres away from us, folks. About six feet. Probably about a metre away in front of the vehicle. <laughs> so close, I can't even get a photograph of him. There we go, my boy. Hello. Hello. Very inquisitive and very, very habituated, so uh, he's looking for something to chew at the moment. Just experimenting as a youngster, as all youngsters do. <laughs> I 
and now he's gone out of vision. He's so close. We, oh, there he is. Uh, Chris, your question was, is the, preg is the female still pregnant? Um, I'm having a look from here and I would say yes. Um, <laughs> little guy, funny little guy. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, she hasn't stood up yet, so it's hard to just get a, an indication of what her, her uh, abdomen looks like and whether she's still quite heavy there. But I think she still is, and we will definitely uh, have a little look at that when she stands up. Very, very hard to tell whether she's given, given birth uh, to her pups. At the moment, she could go down and suckle those pups, but at the same time, uh, she could be uh, just... We probably see some indication that there was. Uh, she'd probably be down in the... In the in the den still but we'll definitely keep an eye on it Chris and make sure we keep you updated on that and everyone but a great question and thank you very much Really lovely, and to see uh, him, this or <laughs> him or her, this little guy, this little guy active, uh, and that uh, normally when it's really, really hot, they're they're still sort of lying around and trying to escape that heat. But he's he's really having a fine time with this little little stick here. <laughs> Morning and playing around, he's been playing with sticks and all manner of things, and uh, he's now having a little sniff through some old elephant dung there. Uh, we can't quite see him, but I can't move forward. I'm just going to wait for him to come back, because um, you won't stray too far from from that area. Uh, he's He's got a little bit of an investigative uh, sort of head on, or hat on this morning, and he's just gonna, going to come through the other side of these this vegetation. But what a beautiful and charismatic little cub he is. He's got such great character and he's been fantastic to us. He comes right up to the vehicle and gives us a little uh, a little look at him and then he's been playing with these sticks and having a proper bit of fun this morning. Uh, just as you find a lot of young carnivores, whether they be domestic or wild, they love to play like a lot of animals and uh, <laughs> he's he's just got a really great uh, great attitude very likeable little character this guy and Chris Rogue uh, asked a great question you know which is on everyone's lips I suppose is uh, uh, she still pregnant the mother um, or the female or the mother of this one and the answer to that was uh, basically from me Chris I'm not sure <laughs> he just <laughs> ran over the top of her um, the answer to that is I'm not it looks like she is. I'm, I'm suspecting she is. I'm probably sort of 90% sure that she still is. Uh, and she will give birth to those cubs down in that den. Now it's normally only about two, 
cubs in the litter. It can range between one and sort of four-ish uh, in numbers, but it's generally sort of two on average. The interesting thing about hyena as well is that they're um, they don't necessarily have a breeding season, so to speak. They uh, they can breed all year round, and uh, it really does just depend on available food source. Again, I suppose, but um, there's no sort of set season for for uh, hyena. So it's classified as what we call as non-seasonal breeding, and uh, they will probably have a tendency to, uh, depending on what area they're in, do it around times when the food is more plentiful. But I've seen hyena in the middle of winter uh, definitely having having cubs, um, yeah, having cubs to, or having having their cubs emerge from the uh, from the den. So beautiful to watch. A lot of the time you see hyena either lying around or sort of skulking through the, the undergrowth on the, on the tail of a kill uh, or doing some of their own hunting uh, at this time of the year uh, with all the, all the hoofed animals dropping um, their offspring. So, but it's just great to be around a, part, a cub I always slip into pup. It's just it's really funny. You 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 talk about you see wild dogs and uh, you know pups and cubs. These are classified as cubs, and uh, it's just so fantastic to have this little activity in front of us. And he's really investigating so many things for us this morning. Copy mate, copy. Uh, HT to all radios, uh, HT to all radios. Uh, any update on uh, the Angala? Okay mate, just stand by mate. Folks, I'm just going to let you watch these pictures. So if you hear me talking in the background, uh, what I'm trying to do is see if we can get an update on our spot on these line. So just bear with me for a second and uh, I'll make a couple of calls. HT2 uh, all radios on the Angala lock on uh, Gowrie Main. Uh, any updates on the line up there, please? Control, do you copy? 
yeah I have no comms uh, on their channel at all I'm not getting any response uh, would you be able to try and go through Scott and see if he can uh, get me a slot on that uh, that Angala lineup please that is for you yeah I am um, I'm not getting any response on my radio on the game drive channel for the Eastern channel so if you could just uh, see if Scott is receiving that signal from that area if he could try and get me a slot uh, and let me know uh, whether we can come up to that Angala siding please Okay, mate, standing by, thanks. Sorry, mate. Sorry, sorry. I, I'm in a really hard position here, folks. That's beautiful, isn't it? What a lovely shot. We've parked the vehicle right up. Uh, at the den here, and I'm I'm sorry I get my uh, my head in the way sometimes, folks, and uh, I'm trying to sort of juggle underneath the camera, but uh, this is just so lovely to see. We have a question from Judy in Ottawa in Canada uh, and she, Judy thanks for watching and, and great to have you with us. Um, Judy's asking why are these two hyena by themselves and don't they normally uh, congregate or associate in, in clans? Well they do Judy but it just depends on many many different things. Uh, uh, they're quite transient in their in their uh, sort of social structure. Sometimes they'll go off hunting by themselves. Sometimes they'll go hunt off in in, in a clan situation and or in a bigger group. Again, depending on food availability. But uh, at the moment, this female is quite close to uh, dropping her her cubs into this den and sort of. Uh, probably spending a little bit less time hunting and a bit more time uh, preparing for that. We do get down to this to this uh, den site and see several times uh, just the cub by himself where she will off, be off hunting uh, and we have, I did see this individual recently um, this uh, off with another individual up hunting on uh, another uh, uh, area so it really just does depend on a lot of different things they can spend some of their time quite quite solitary uh, and other times they can be um, they can be in a clan situation just taking a couple of images here just to get a couple of shots of this little individual because he's so close at the moment Now I'm just going to have to drop out of the way for you. Okay, I copied that, mate. Thank you. Uh, we'll we'll do just that.
So I just think we'll just stick with him just for a few more minutes. It's just so lovely to see him. And I, I, I'm, it's really beautiful, isn't it? Uh, really nice. Beautiful to see. Okay, folks, I think what we'll do is we're going to make our way back. I've got a bit of uh, word going through the, the radio that um, people have been trying to contact me, but because we're down in this really low area here, uh, it's very, very difficult for our game drive channel to pick up uh, any signal. So we might just make our way back and see what uh, happens. We'll sort of hang, hang back a little bit. I'm sure someone will bring us in just now, um, but it's just been a matter of listening to the Game Drive channel and uh, trying to hear this broken radio signal, which uh, happens a lot to me when I get down into these low areas, and it really is uh, difficult to understand or hear. Thank you very much, Ndapandula. You gave us a beautiful little encounter there. Mm. Absolutely fantastic, Brian, hey? Yeah, that was good. Really lovely to watch that little cub playing around and just, he's in such perfect condition. He or she, we don't know. Um, but uh, we'll come back and see them again. I think Brian, um, Scott will probably want to come and see them tomorrow morning because he hasn't seen them for a few days. And uh, we'll go and see if we can find ourselves some some things with big whiskers. So what we should do, folks, is uh, whilst we're making our way to this line kill, let's get Scott uh, up, up onto uh, your screens and see what he's up to, because I'm sure he's been working really, really hard to find <coughs> Leopard. And uh, let's have a little, little catch up with him, because I, I think it's really important that uh, we find that Leopard, and I know he's going to be like really on it this morning. So we'll cross to Scott, and we'll see you just now. Welcome back, folks. We are currently arriving at Buffalo's Hook Dam. It's been a very quiet morning thus far. So I'm hoping you guys are going to bring us some good fortune.
We've covered many roads and different tracks and have yet to come up with anything and actually seen hardly any animals in between. And we have those mornings out here. I hope the hyena den site was entertaining. And I think Hayden has a trick or two up his sleeve, so stay tuned for what he has in store for you guys. In a There's some white-breasted cormorants that I would like to get a visual of. They around in another corner of the, the dam. So let me reposition the Very quick dip. Um, so I'm not bringing up in some bits and pieces, but I'll be back up on the other side shortly. Sorry about that little lapse in broadcasting there. We went through a very deep dip. But now we have a wonderful view of the white-breasted cormorants. And what they're doing here, or at least two out of the four of them, is that they're drying out their wings. So they've obviously had a successful morning fishing. And now they are drying off. It also could be that they may be nervous of us and therefore would like to dry their wings in the preparation for potentially flying off. Highly, highly specialized bird, the, the cormorants. They basically fly underwater when chasing their fish, their prey. There are some incredible sequences of footage where they have managed to somehow capture these cormorants hunting underwater and they're extremely quick and also maneuverable under the water which is surprising they can hold their breath for 30 seconds 40 seconds from what i've seen when they've been hunting which is quite remarkable considering the energy they're expending when chasing fish searching or at least searching for them underwater the next skill that they have is being able to see the fish. I mean, this water's chocolate brown, so how on earth they manage to track down their prey is a mystery to me. I guess they could potentially swim underwater until they actually make contact with something and then hopefully clamp down with it with an open beak that's primed and ready to snap shut. Not the best weather for them to be drying out their cool and cloudy today which we certainly are enjoying for a change of scenery. It's been extremely hot. Yesterday was a scorching day and then a thunder shower at around midnight last night has cooled things off again. 
So hopefully the rain will be at bay. It's perfect when it does rain in between game drives as opposed to during them. Because then we get the cooling effect. The vegetation gets all the water they need to continue growing. And we are unharmed on our game drive. We'll pan back to the cormorants shortly. Let's see what this pod of hippos has for us to see. So there's all shapes and sizes here. A few adolescents, a big bull. I haven't been watching them too closely as I've been keeping an eye on these cormorants. To just as you have been. So now that we are going to focus on them, we'll see if there are any youngsters. The youngsters tend to hide away a lot more and are a little, little bit more nervous. They are also shorter than their parents, which means they obviously cannot stand. This hippo that we can see in view now, it will be standing or even potentially lying down. They don't float. So the youngsters, because they are, have got shorter limbs, they sometimes have to use their mother's back to help prop them up in order to get a breath of air. A good time of year for the hippo. Due to all the fresh shoots coming through. Whereas in winter they can be traveling 10 to 15 kilometers round trip in search of good grazing as things begin to dry out. It would be interesting to know where these hippos do go to do the majority of their grazing because it's a heavily wooded area, this. And actually the first time that I've been to this, this dam. So, really enjoying this. Change of scenery from what I have been seeing. Still no sign of the injured hippo. Well, it hasn't been for a few days. We're all wondering where he could be. We're hoping he's doing okay, wherever that he may find himself. But interesting, we have been chatting with the guides on the other surrounding properties and nobody seems to know where he could be. It would be hard to tell if he, he was in amongst this pod, obviously because they all submerged. But what we can assume is that the dominant bull in this pod would certainly not tolerate him. And therefore, yes, we can fairly safely assume that he's not one of these. Watching them all relax like this certainly does 
give you a false sense of security or a false idea as to how quickly they can move and how aggressive they can be. I've seen hippos fighting only a few times and not very serious fights when, when they were fighting, but it really, really is astounding when you do see them in full swing. And as humans, we also do have to keep a very close eye out when on foot or on small rafts and areas where hippos occur. They can be dangerous when they're in water and also especially dangerous when you come across them on land, if they're on their way to or from grazing in the early hours of the morning or the late hours of the evening. You do not want to cross paths with, with one of these, these chaps. They can can tend to be highly aggressive animals when confronted on foot. But at the moment, they look extremely peaceful and unaggressive, which is wonderful. Okay. It is time to continue our quest. I just saw a cuckoo fly past. I'm hoping we're going to be able to see and establish the species. Is. The cuckoos are highly active at this time of the year because they're searching for hosts in which species raise their young for, which really is a genius plan. But we have hit the jackpot little interesting critter in the road. If you just zoom in Jason, about 10 meters ahead of us on the left hand side of the road you will see what I'm talking about. Quickly, if possible, because it's trying to scoot off. Okay, lower down. There we go. That, my friends, is a chameleon. The flap neck chameleon. And you can notice how it's kind of stammering backwards and forwards as it walks. And it does that to, to simulate being a leaf or a blade of grass blowing in the wind. It also had a few yellow spots and white spots to help break up its body pattern or body shape. Um, I'm going to try my best to get into another position now. Or what I may just do Let's see Park myself into a thorn bush here so I'm gonna have to jump over the bonnet And see if we can find him. I'll just get a little stick and put him on a stick in order to show you guys What's what? The trick is finding it again now. Where on earth did it go? Well, 
Well, this is a classic example of what chameleons do best. They disappear and blend in with their surroundings. And it is now making me feel like somewhat of a clown. Can you remember where it went, Jason? Uh, is it in here? It went came yeah, in here right there, there, exactly there. Ah, here he is. Here he is. Really, really beautiful. Look at those colorations. Quite incredible. One eye staring back at me. I can't see the other one, but it's probably staring back at you guys. They've got an incredible ability to be able to move their eyes omnidirectionally, meaning that like now it's looking back at me and with its other eye it can be looking forward. Look at those beautiful cryptic markings. Critical for camouflage is not only color, but also shades. The more different shades there are, the more it will break up a solid, uh, solid color or structure, thus making it harder to pick up or see. It's even got some beautiful stripes that it's flared up on its eyes. And they've got special pores called chromatophores that they can fill accordingly with different color or different amounts of color to create the shades they're looking for. This is a medium sized one. They get about twice the size when they're fully grown. And this is the only chameleon that we find in this area, the flap neck chameleon. They are one of my favorite creatures. I've seen only a very few few times when I've had a lot of spare time on my hands. I've sat with chameleons and watched them and waited and waited and finally after waiting for longer than your normal person would wait to see it, a fly will land or a grasshopper will land on the end of a branch and they shake their head from side to side kind of lining up and getting their, their directions and calculations correct and then that tongue comes shooting out at such a high speed. I've never seen them miss in the few times that I have seen them go for, go for insects. Now this is called the flap neck chameleon because if we were to agitate it, it would flare up the underside of its, or its throat and when it does flare that part of its throat there's orange pigment there and typically bright orange colors or bright colors red orange yellows tend to scare off potential predators it's termed aposomatic coloration and birds have it some some butterflies have it as well so brightly colored animals typically tend to be not too tasty As great as this is folks, I, and even though it is completely relaxed, I think we should put him back into a bush and let him carry on with his day. Interesting to see that it is on the move today because it is quite cool. So being a cold-blooded animal, you typically find they don't move as much during the, the cooler, cooler weather. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, folks, I believe Hayden has got a very interesting and somewhat larger animal to show you guys. So, from the chameleon and Jason and myself, we'll see you later.
Hi folks, uh, well I've been looking everywhere and Brian's had his eyes open as well and we just, just can't seem to find these lines. If anyone can see them, if you can help me, that'd be fantastic. Still can't quite find these lines. Oh, a bit of a joke. I had to have a little bit of a little bit of a joker there. Folks, we are in the presence of the Birmingham boys again, and it's so fantastic. They are right next to us. These are two meters, three meters away from us at the moment. And uh, there they all are, looking beautiful. One, two, three, four, five of them. Lovely little bit of interaction here. I'm just going to roll down for Brian here. You see this lovely interaction from them. They have made a kill, so we're going to stay with them for a little bit of time here. We're really, really fortunate to be here. We had to wait our little, uh, our little slot. Is that good for you, Brian? It's good. Okay. So we're about three meters from these guys at the moment. The five of them, they've got absolutely massive bellies. And uh, they've just had a big feed. And we'll show you what we've had a feed on in a minute. They did take down a buffalo and they've consumed about probably, mm, I'd probably say about two th a third of it. And uh, they're feeling very, very full. I'm just going to get a couple of photographs to try and, when you get this close, it's really good to try and get uh, a couple of marks on their ears and things like that and identification shots. We thought they were going to do that last night. They looked like they were lean. They looked like they were off going to, to hunt. And uh, sure enough, they had success. Just uh, about 500, uh, maybe 500 to 800 meters of where we had them. So it's quite fantastic to uh, be this close and in their presence. We literally are about 10 feet from them and uh, they're very relaxed with us, incredibly comfortable. Look at the size of that belly. <laughs> that is a full belly. This fantastic socialising that's going on in, in front of us, folks. Beautiful, happy, happy cats. <laughs> Look at this. These two brothers having a little bit of a play.
think one's taken another one's space. The bellies on those tell, tell the story, folks. They are full of buffalo. They are very, very content. And they'll be digesting here for the next probably 24 hours, trying to protect their, their kill, which is behind us, which I will show you in a minute. <coughs> and uh, they've consumed about a third of it, as I said. So we just got a question from Pup Equality on uh, on Twitter and wants to know whether cats, uh, the bigger cats, get uh, fur balls just like domestic cats and have to regurgitate that up. They do. Uh, I've never actually seen it happen, but um, I know that they do and uh, they groom it themselves exactly like domestic cats do. Uh, they spend a lot of time grooming. There's normally a lovely little grooming session that hope happens just after they wake up. They'll do some nice grooming and a, a bit of yawning. Even when they're lying there, uh, they'll start yawning and that's just a signal that they're about to um, awaken and get a bit more active. And that's exactly what happened last night. Then they'll groom each other. Uh, I'm sorry, they'll groom themselves. And uh, sometimes you'll see, the, obviously, the parents, the, the mother, sorry, um, grooming the cubs. But they do get to get fur balls. I've just never seen it uh, uh, come out, uh, but I know that I've, I've read that they they do. So, grooming goes on very very similar to what it does with domestic cats, and you'll see a lot of similarities when you're sitting watching a uh, line like that. Morning, mate. How are you guys? All good? Very nice, mate. Thanks so much, mate. Don't have, mate. Yeah, it's been a bit tricky this morning, and I was down in a dip, so the comms were really bad, and uh, but everyone helped uh, out, so thank you so much, mate. Have you been? Already? No, no, it's the first time. Okay, well, let me just, uh, I can roll down a little bit. Okay. okay. All right, guys. So this is the lovely thing, folks. You know, Cedric's just turned up, a really wonderful guide, and uh, he helped me come in here this morning with all the all the radio comms because I was breaking up in the area I was, and everyone just helps each other. There's this wonderful community. It's this great bunch of guys that help, help, help. When we came in this morning, I sort of, I just sort of stuck our nose in here, but there was a bit of queue, so that's why I had to revert. But now um, things have quietened down a little bit. We've got uh, our cats uh, again, and we'll sit around with them for a little bit longer. Occasionally they get up and go off and have a little bit of more of a, uh, a, a go on the, uh, the carcass, uh, just depending on how they're feeling. <laughs> but at the moment... Uh, they're just uh, jostling each other for uh, position and getting annoyed with each other, putting each other's feet on each other.
So last night when we were talking about um, the, the bulkiness of the mane and everything like that, making the, the males more conspicuous um, when it comes to hunting, it's obviously these these um, individuals haven't got their full mane. They're only about probably two and a half years old, these guys. Uh, and they won't get that full mane until they're about five. But when they do get that full mane, um, that, that massive, showy, sort of really... Um, obvious beautiful mane does become a bit more conspicuous when it comes to hunting so uh, males will only really at that age uh, will only really hunt for themselves if there's no females to do it for them and if there's no chance of them scavenging or, or, or taking uh, a kill off something else so um, they really they will step up to the plate when it when when it it's important to for themselves but um, they'll normally go for the easy way out firstly but when it comes to these guys there are no females around there there's five of them they've got uh, they're a little bit younger they're a little bit less conspicuous with their sort of sort of manes only about a third of the way along or maybe even a quarter of the way along compared to what they get to so they have to get up uh, and do what they've got to do to fill, fill their bellies and they had great success uh, today or last night and who knows when it was but um, by looking at the carcass uh, it was probably sort of about uh, the hours after the carcass uh, it was probably sort of about uh, the hours after we we, uh, we left them but it is a female buffalo that they've pulled down. the moment. They'll, they'll definitely hear something if it comes up, a hyena or, a, or anything else, but um, I've got an eye on it for them. <laughs> no, they're, they're, uh, they've got bellies bigger than they can uh, cope with at the moment. They're really incredible. So yeah, interesting to see the Birmingham boys uh, Uh, Birmingham boys may have had a little little go at them. Well, they obviously did and uh, had great success, which is fantastic to see them uh, a successful coalition of five males. And if they stay together and they meet up with a pride and take over, over a pride, they will be an absolute force to be reckoned with. The Nkahuma pride, uh, which Pete, uh, I think, saw a little bit of, excuse me, um, of maybe a week or two ago, uh, which is, consists of about nine females, or eight females, I think, and, and, and one male. It's roughly those numbers. If these boys were in their prime at uh, about five years of age and came across them, they would, I would say, pretty much 90% sure that they would, they would take over that, uh, that pride. 
um, if they had their wits about them and they had their strength and they had their, their courage to do it, five miles like this, my goodness, it's a uh, it's an incredibly uh, huge force. <clears throat> and we did talk about it a little bit last night. Um, all the males is definitely a powerful thing uh, when it comes to taking over the females uh, or taking over a pride and pushing another male off. But uh, sometimes it can get to numbers where it be can become quite insta uh, unstable. Uh, lots of lots of strategy and lots of competition and and so on and so on uh, so there can be some instability through that as well so you know sometimes the more successful uh, coalitions are just two males um, and and a smaller pride and uh, less mouths to feed with greater success but it depends on so many things folks so many different things the concentration of line in the particular area and the availability of uh, food and so on and so on whether they're living on a private reserve like a protected reserve like this or whether they're on communal land uh, it really does have a lot of external contributing factors that uh, play a role in how the structure uh, of, of the, the pride uh, carries on and goes forward We just got a, uh, a tweet from Shaney. Hi Shaney and welcome aboard. Uh, we found the boys again and your question is a great question about uh, the main. The main, will the main get, uh, they see these boys but seem to be very blonde in colour and will their mane darken up and, keep, and continue to get blacker? Well Shaney, I've seen uh, lines from all over Africa, from, uh, from Uganda, uh, on the border, the northern border of Uganda, right down to Namibia and South Africa. And I've seen all different colours and all different shapes and all different uh, intensities of colour. So the area that we're in at the moment, um, there has a tendency from the males that I have seen, images of, uh, that they seem to be ha have a, a reasonable black sort of uh, tinge to them and the individual that we can see at the moment and on the left hand top left of the screen he can see the coloration starting to get a little bit darker under on his under mane there um, I'm probably certain that they will go go dark on these guys I've seen some uh, animals in Kenya that have got a very very blonde mane like to the point where it's still full mane but it's so blonde uh, it just looks pretty much the same colour as uh, the hair on uh, the top of their head uh, or their, their face. So it really does, it's, gen it's a genetic uh, trait that will be carried on uh, throughout different regions and it will differ over time uh, but it goes from very very black, uh, not, not jet black of course but uh, very very dark and black in parts with that that really beautiful um, sort of fawn undertone and then you've got the uh, the really really blonde uh, maned animals as well so a whole range but great question and these ones I'm pretty certain would go um, pretty dark uh, looking from the, the genetics and, and the images that I've seen of other animals in the area hopefully that answers your question animals as well so a whole range but great question and these ones I'm pretty certain would go um, pretty dark uh, looking from the, the genetics and, and the images that I've seen of other animals in the area hopefully that answers your question
too trashy. No idea. Cool weather. Folks, you might hear a bit of rustling around. I do apologise. I'm just uh, putting my uh, my jacket on. It's really cold. <laughs> I'm going soft in my old age. Um, I just uh, need to get a jacket on and uh, sit here and stop shivering. When I say really cold, I'm sure people are like, uh, that's not really cold, HT. Um, that's not really cold at all. It's 18 degrees, folks. It's a summer, summer's holiday for some people. So apologies for all the background noise, folks, but um, I just have... When I say really cold, I'm sure people are like, uh, that's not really cold, HT. Um, that's not really cold at all. It's 18 degrees, folks. It's a summer, summer's holiday for some people. So apologies for all the background noise, folks, but um, I just have Just got an, uh, a question from Deb on email, and Deb wants to know: Are they flies or fleas on their their bellies and backs? Uh, and Deb, they are actually little little flies. They're really annoying. Uh, some of them that you can see are biting flies, and others are uh, are not. Uh, but they're really annoying to the lions, and there's particularly the one that's uh, lying down that you're looking at now. Uh, pretty full on, uh, but as soon as he rolls over they move and they just go to another part of his body. It's probably got something to do with uh, lying on the some of the blood from the carcass as well that uh, potentially uh, got onto their, their skin, so they, that's what they would probably be, uh, be on them for. You don't normally see that amount in that location on a line. It's just that he's been lying on, on uh, the ground and and uh, they definitely uh, do have biting flies which really annoy them and um, those ones there are, are quite severe but uh, if it was too bad he would uh, he would roll over and get them off. It's just something they deal with, it's something that they deal with and a lot of the, all nearly all animals in the wild deal with, uh, with that. <laughs> That one that just rolled over, sort of lying upside down, if you just pan left a little bit uh, bright, that one there, he's got a bit of an injury on his, his left eye. Um, he's had a bit of a knock or he's had a bit of a scratch and uh, you can't really see it now, but we'll keep an eye on that to show you. He's got he's had a little bit of a, a bit of a scuffle with someone and uh, it seems to be a little bit different to his other eye, so he might have a scar on the on the top of it or something. He's definitely got some scars on his ears. <coughs> Excuse me, so uh, he's actually the individual that we were looking at when we saw them a couple of days ago when people were asking uh, about the scars uh, and this is the, the animal that we were actually looking at. I just think they're struggling to lie down. They're struggling to get comfortable because they've got so much food in their bellies. That's quite lovely to see this this uh, sort of tender moments that they have between the, the five of them because they they are five brothers and uh, <coughs> they will probably stay together as we said, but the the playfulness and the sort of intimacy that they have now doesn't really continue over f after five they uh, they have a tendency not to play as much uh, as they do when they're youngsters and then they get to an age where they just sort of that play play is out of the question folks 
but um, the, the females, as I said last night, um, continue to play throughout their life. Yeah, you make very well, very well. How are you? Very good. <laughs> Lots of rolling around trying to get comfortable. <laughs> Lots of rolling around trying to get comfortable. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> We've got about 25 minutes to go, folks, so uh, we'll, we'll just sit with these guys, and I'm sure Scott's still desperately trying to uh, track down this leopard because I know he had his heart set on this morning. I really want uh, a leopard for Scott, so. I'm sure he's doing uh, his best and he's, he's an amazing, uh, he's got some great experience and is a really super, super knowledgeable. So if, um, if the bush uh, delivers uh, it, it, this morning, it, he should be in the right place. But we'll just sit here for a little bit because they could at any point get up and walk across back to that, uh, back to the kill. We'll definitely show you the kill before we... Uh, before we leave, um, that female buffalo that I, set, I told you about earlier. But uh, just nice to see some interaction with these guys because they're not sort of fully asleep yet. They're, they're rolling around and sort of having a which is kind of nice. Getting annoyed with each other for taking each other's space. You can see that quick reaction to um, one of the uh, individuals just flicked his tail and as he flicked his tail uh, they all sat up. So they're listening, they're constantly listening even though they look like they're asleep. They can be on their toes in a split second.
We just got a question from Anne on Twitter um, about the lines that all seem to be touching each other. It's a really good question, Anne. Um, I sort of just touched on it a little bit uh, earlier. This would probably not be the same if they were about five years older. Not always, but um, they, they are still close brothers and they're only probably about two and a half years old. So they do have a very, very tight bond with each other, uh, which will still be tight as they're older, but um, not probably as tactile as they are now. Um, they still could lay next to each other, but they probably potentially wouldn't be uh, uh, sort of as sort of, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the words are, they probably wouldn't be playing as much as they are in the sense of just rolling around on each other. They still give each other these incredible um, greetings and uh, lovely sort of uh, social uh, interactions when they, when they all wake up. But um, there's definitely a social bond here that's going on that we're seeing uh, through five individuals that were born from the same litter and have gone through the past few years together and now have been pushed out from their pride and uh, have to take on life for themselves and go out into the big bad world um, well the big beautiful world I should say but big bad world for a, a young lion uh, going out there who's got a lot of things to be concerned about now if there was just a single uh, animal that would probably be a much more uh, arduous journey but with these five, as we talked about earlier, they're a bit of a force to be reckoned with. They'll look after each other, they'll protect each other fiercely, and uh, uh, the situation that we see now is definitely that, and a very, very um, content, uh, full-bellied bunch of lines that are socially very, very tight uh, because of coming from the same litter and uh, the age that they're at. that is absolutely yes uh, they do they can sustain extraordinary uh, wounds from uh, buffalo particularly they can open themselves up with those incredible horns that the buffalo got I'm just looking across at the buffalo kill now which I promise you we will show you but uh, it's the, the horns on that could still sustain, they could sustain really serious injuries from that but when you get onto these big bull uh, buffalo, they can be unbelievably big, I'm very, very sharp, and can lift the line. I actually have seen footage being through the air uh, that you can't believe. This is like an animal. Uh, it was a lioness, uh, so you're looking at sort of 150, 170 kilograms uh, at, at a full, at a full grown. That's a beautiful shot. Look at that. Look at that. You're just plonk down to the end. I just, what's just happened now, folks, is that male has just gone off, um, and this is a really love, incredible trait that lions have. Uh, I think 
if it is what I, I think. Um, they, if they're lying in a group like this really tight, uh, they go off to uh, go and do their dung somewhere else and, uh, and then come back to the group. So very well mannered, uh, these lines. And uh, then they come back uh, and lie down together, but I think that's what that one has done. But just to say, um, the, fat the fatal injuries, uh, Ginny, they do have uh, incredible injuries they sustain. And it might not be a, an open wound, it might be a fracture um, that they never recover from. And what was, if they, don't, they can't keep up with the pride, they'll be left behind. Uh, and that happens quite regularly, and it just depends on uh, how successful uh, they are and how many of their numbers are. You do find that uh, animals that do take on big prey animals, like for example buffalo, and there's only a couple of them, they might be, excuse the pun, but they might be biting off a bit more than they can chew. That uh, have a certain number of young buffalo will start to try to take prey that they aren't quite ready for. Uh, so if they come across a buffalo, they have a go, they, have a, they tackle a buffalo, they could sustain a fatal injury easily. Really, really important for them to learn, learn from others and to hunt strategically if they can. The ambush predators, so they will really do their, uh, their utmost to sort of work their poor or can't get out of. And if it isn't an area that they can't get out of and it's open plains, you'll find that um, a couple of lions will normally push uh, the prey animal onto uh, the, uh, the the ambushes, uh, for want of a better word. So the unsuspecting prey animal will walk or be pushed onto the uh, lions that are lying waiting in ambush. So there's a few different st strategies that do do happen. There has been some studies that have been um, done about lions taking up regular positions. Let me just take have a quick drink because I'm a bit dry. Oh, excuse me, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> There's been some studies and some research showing that lions uh, in some parts of Africa do actually uh, take up regular hunting positions. Some are fantastic ambushers and others are fantastic at uh, flanking down to particular size. And some research has shown that uh, they have taken up those regular positions, just like players on a football field, uh, knowing that they play better in that position. That's where they're strongest and uh, that's where they benefit. But then after the kill is made, they'll grudgingly share the food and often battle for position on that food. Uh, they don't have any sort of pecking order, it's just uh, get in there, other than the males pushing the females out of the way first, having their share and then uh, the females coming in. So there's a lot of uh, grudging, grudging sort of uh, share tactics that go in there, and there's a lot of scuffles and uh, theatrics that go on. So it can, uh, injuries can occur during those those feeding sessions as well. Okay, folks, we're going to um, have a cross over to Scott. See what he's up to. I'm sure he's been tracking down those leopards and doing his best because it's it's really tricky after the. If that uh, if those tracks that we had last night are obliterated, um, which they would have been, uh, to pick up the track is is very very difficult. But um, he's really good, and I'm sure he would have done his best. So we'll just see what what he's up to. We'll cross to him, and uh, we'll come back, and we'll see you just now. Welcome back, folks. Oh, I'd like to say goodbye. I thought we'd pop in and see if the injured Impala lamb is still okay. And it is. Um, we can see her here. Still limping. But yet to be found out by any of the predators, which is good news. 
but yet to be found out by any of the predators, which is good news. And yeah, folks, thanks for, for joining us this morning. We are from my side, but that's how it goes out here. I was just telling Jason, we put our quiet drives away, and that means we've got lots of excitement to look forward to in future drives. So I really did enjoy the chameleon though. It's such an incredible animal to view up close and get to see how those eyes work and those beautiful patterns. So I hope that I certainly did. Good morning. Back to Hayden. Well, they haven't done much. They haven't done much at all <laughs> since we just talked to you. It was very short. Uh, but I think we should probably just have a look at this, uh, this kill here. We, not a pleasant thing to look at for some people, but it's the food chain and that's how it works. Uh, it is a buffalo cow that they've... Uh, we'll just have a glance over at that and just show you because it's, it's really interesting to know. A considerable amount of the uh, animal but a lot of the the muscle tissue on the on the end uh, on the front end or the front section still still there and uh, we've got that front section still to be consumed but all the really nutritious uh, internal organs which is what they go for first has been consumed and the back legs pretty much uh, devoured so it's still there it's uh, definitely for them, we'll, uh, and little snacks on that as they go. They'll come uh, when they get the urge. They'll just go to the uh, the larder across the road there and uh, hook on into a bit more of that. So just thought it'd be interesting to show you that. Uh, it's killed right on the side of the road here, <coughs> which for us is fantastic because uh, we don't have to go driving through uh, country some. Uh, with that we always do it the best we possibly can but it just makes uh, a great viewing for everybody that comes to see it and uh, it's a really great option uh, uh, to get a few people around here still only three vehicles uh, at the same time uh, on the on it at the moment it's just our, ourselves and another vehicle Three vehicles uh, at the same time uh, on the on it. At the moment, it's just our, ourselves and another vehicle. We just got a question from Lev on Twitter and Lev uh, wants to know if if they do kill something lighter than a buffalo so not as heavy as a buffalo uh, Lev is meaning there um, take their their uh, their prey, their kill up into a tree like leopards do. Um, the answer to that is no, Lev. Uh, they don't. They don't have the uh, the same ability as a leopard. And pound for pound, the leopard is the ultimate cat when it comes to strength, uh, muscle to weight ratio. Um, really nice to see that boy there. Just look up. Uh -huh. Incredibly. Good. Sorry, Lev. I'm coming back to your finish your your question, but incredibly good uh, ears. A vulture has just landed behind uh, us. And this lion may get up to scare this vulture off in a second. I want to stay on the lion as opposed to the vulture. Um, So he's probably going to get up, I'd say, 
and uh, shoo this vulture off. Even though it's only a vulture, they do not like anyone taking any of their food. Lev, I'm coming back to your question, I promise you, to finish it. I just want to see what happens with this, uh, with this, uh, this line. Just got his eyes on, I'm just telling you what the vulture's doing. He's, uh, the vulture's staying his distance at the moment um, because he can see the lines. And if the vulture gets, gets a bit closer to the line, we'll uh, get up and have a little bit of a, a bit of a snarl. So sorry, Lev. Uh, I didn't mean to uh, be rude and interrupt uh, that your question with that, but it's just when you do get a little bit of interaction like that, um, you uh, obviously want to talk about that uh, or some behaviour. So back to your question, um, no, they don't take their animal, uh, their kills up trees. I have seen, well, we saw it here the other day as well, lions do go into trees occasionally. The tree has to be a particular shape and size. Um, in Uganda, I do see trees, uh, lions going to trees regularly uh, up there. Um, and in some areas of Tanzania as well. Um, and they really do uh, spend more time up there resting. So we did see a little bit up the other day, experimenting, walking along there. They're a little bit more cumbersome up a tree than a leopard. Uh, leopards are just the, pre the, the absolute kings of, of uh, arboreal uh, ta uh, sort of tactics up there, taking their kills uh, up, up trees and, and, and storing them up there. And that's a fantastic adaptation that uh, they have to secure their, their uh, kill away from lions and, and other, other predators like hyena and, uh, and wild dogs. Um, so it really is a great uh, adaptation that leopard have, but lion just don't have that ability to take it up the tree. And you know what, they don't have to worry about it either, Lev, because the power of the numbers uh, lets them, majority of the time, protect their, um, their, their kill. And that's one of the advanta advantages, sorry, that... Uh, that they have is because of their numbers they can protect their kill uh, a lot easier whereas leopard uh, are a solitary animal and they uh, don't have the numbers so that's why they have adapted their behavior to take their, their kills up trees. Hopefully that's answered it for you Lev, uh, but fantastic question. <laughs> so that one just gave a little bit of a shake. Thank you so much. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Have a great one, guys. We had another vehicle uh, with one of the guides just sitting there then and when the, the uh, individual at the back, he shook, shook some flies off his, his uh, ears. They all sat up in a bit of a shock and thinking that something was approaching. And then uh, once they all realised it was nothing, they all just <laughs> resumed their positions. Just lovely to see. Well, folks, I'm going to slowly wind up now. I've got about four minutes to go, and uh, I just want to thank you all for thank you for for uh, being with us today and just sticking with us. And I do apologise profusely about those those gaps in the in the transmission, and also the gaps when I was just sort of staring off into the distance, listening to three radio channels talking to me at once, and trying to work out where these animals were. 
uh, and then also getting us in on onto these animals. It just took a little bit of uh, a little bit of manoeuvring and, and communication with all the guys. So apologies about that, but thank you for sticking with us. And I'm sure you understand. We really, really strive to do our best to get you into these locations and see these beautiful animals. And uh, it takes a little bit of uh, of coordinating uh, your own mind and vehicles and radios and people and everything. But we're here. That's the most important thing. We're with the Birmingham boys. Uh, absolutely fantastic they've got a buffalo kill right next to the road and we'll be coming back to see them later on this afternoon um, I really want Pete to see these guys as well because he has never met this particular group of males and uh, I'm definitely going to get him in on these this afternoon so uh, Pete's having a bit of a, a break this morning and uh, We'll be back in the saddle this afternoon for our first transmission across uh, the natural, National Geographic channels and Nat Geo Wild. Plus, we'll still be online in all the normal ways uh, that you've been watching over the past month. Check out the websites. Um, have a good look around. We'll be back with you this afternoon for sure. Uh, so don't worry, we're not sort of leaving the online service as well. We're just also broadcasting for Big Cat Week on Nat Geo uh, Channel and Nat Geo Wild, which we're really excited about. Uh, but all our regular safari punters that are in the back of our vehicles, we just can't thank you enough because you're the guys that have been with us right through this technical phase and have stuck with us online. We really, really appreciate all your support. So, I think in my last minute, I'd like to say farewell from another fantastic morning here in Juma, right on the border of Arethusa Game Reserves here and uh, how wonderful it's been to have you. We really, really enjoyed this morning. We're gonna come back here this afternoon. Peter will be back with me. Uh, if you've got any questions, send them to uh, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live if you wanna tweet us. Really great to have you. I'm gonna let us finish on the lines. Take care, guys. We'll see you just now. <laughs>